Hello there YouTube, Devin here again, and uh, sorry I haven't made a video in a long time. Uh, it's been uh, real, real busy with work and everything like that. Um, tons of other stuff in my life going on and things like that, So, but I uh, got a helmet video for you today, but this is actually more of a progression video, or what I like to call, uh, it's like the uh, visual his history of like the British uh, composite helmets. Uh, so before we can get into the composite helmets, uh, we need to talk about uh, the last steel helmet they had. And uh, this is the uh, Mark III uh, turtle helmet. And uh, the Mark III turtle helmet came out in 1943. And it was um, developed by the Medical Research Council because it offered uh, superior coverage from every point of impact. Uh, so from the sides, uh, from the top, and uh, overall, it ended up having more coverage on average than the Mark II Brody helmet. So these were uh, first seen on the battlefield during D-Day uh, with Canadian and British uh, soldiers uh, storming the beaches there. Uh, and it continued to serve alongside the Brody all through World War II. And uh, this went to uh, Korea after that. Uh, with uh, British and Canadian and uh, Australian and all those soldiers uh, were using uh, the Mark III's. Now, there's a couple variations. The original Mark III would have had the same liner as the Mark II Brody from World War II. Uh, it would have had um, the Mark IVs, uh, which is this one, and you can tell because it still has the rolled rim. Uh, the difference between the Mark IV and the Mark V is that the Mark V had a simplifi uh, simplified... Uh, manufacturing process it didn't have the rolled rim and stuff like that and uh, it was meant to be used uh, in like India and stuff like that where uh, uh, the machinery wasn't quite as uh, nice and the materials weren't quite as nice uh, and the quality control wasn't as nice so they had to simplify the production uh, but the Mark IV has this liner which is kind of like a fiber plastic liner uh, with foam pads and it has this kind of elastic kind of scrunchy type cover it's a very comfortable helmet that's the thing about british helmets are usually very very comfortable um so and now this helmet was used up until 1985 uh with the british military until it was replaced by the mark six and this is uh the mark six helmet now i have it fully kitted out um if you want to see it with um how this is like how the average soldier would have worn it pretty much uh, when it first came out even though they didn't have this pattern but it's the only mark 6 helmet cover i have uh other than the one that's on my mark 6a so um but this is the mark 6 helmet and it's got your standard stuff so without the night vision mount and everything like that this would be like your average joe sitting at the base somebody would get deployed would have this all right so just your average soldier um and this is uh uh, made out of a ballistic nylon, and uh, it's a very uh, ugly helmet, to be honest, uh, compared to a lot of other helmets. But it's one of the three first composite helmet designs, really, to make its way onto the you know battlefield. It's pretty much this, the Mark VI, um, the American Pazgat, and the Israeli Orlite helmet. And both the American Pazgat, which has turned into pretty much every modern helmet we could think of... Um, uh, you know, the ACH, the ECH, and everything it eventually can trace its roots back to the Pazgat. And um, there's a couple countries and everything that still field the Orlite, and a lot of uh, other helmets are based off the Orlite, like the uh, Yugoslavian MPC helmet, uh, the Russian ZSH helmets, those are based off the Israeli Orlite helmet. But this helmet never really influenced a lot of helmets. And I don't see why, because it's actually a very, very nice helmet. It's very, very effective. I mean, every helmet has its problems, and this has its problems, too. Um, but uh, this was one of the first composite helmets to come out. So um, uh, it's made out of ballistic nylon. It's a little under half an inch thick. I don't think it offers 3A protection. Um, and this was used from 1985 to 2005. Uh, so it was about a 20-year lifespan, which is actually very, very well for uh, a helmet. Um, and it was uh, replaced in 2005 by the Mark 6A because it wasn't meeting uh, protection requirements. Uh, and there was an urgent need uh, to increase uh, protection levels. 
uh, during the uh, Iraq War. So, but this is how um, you normally would have had the normal DPM cover on it uh, back when it was uh, being first issued and uh, everything like that. Uh, so instead of the multicam one or the multi-terrain pattern one, sorry. Um, but this is what the uh, inside looks like. It's kind of a Pazgat style, but only has four straps. It has um, this kind of foam core uh, liner in it. Um, it's got a nice granulated texture. This isn't one of the really early ones with the smooth texture. And it has a three-point adjustable chin strap held in place with one snap. Um, as you can see, it has the United Nations blue cover under it just for storage. You wouldn't normally wear this with two covers. You would normally only wear it with one cover. Um, but uh, just for the sake of keeping them, you know, nice and together and not misplacing them i just have them both on there um has a nice uh rear leather pad it has a nice leather uh four pad and it's just an all in all pretty comfortable helmet i mean the donut tends to cut into your head a little bit but um they solved that in later issues uh later iterations of the same exact helmet it's a pretty adjustable pretty low maintenance uh helmet uh, this there were some initial problems uh, with this helmet because this helmet was designed by uh, NP Aerospace of England, and normally the liner is just held in place with Velcro. The like off the shelf version of this helmet, this whole entire liner, so the suspension, uh, the pads, everything except for the chin strap was held in place with just Velcro in the hell in the shell, and it would tend to come out or move around and stuff. So they ended up trying to soldier proof the helmet by smashing these. Uh, you can see the bottom of one right there these rubber plugs that go through the liner and through the shell and uh they make these little uh horns on top so i don't, you can see that kind of dimple right there as i move it around that's one of these little uh rubber horns that sticks out and it a um it's kind of a compromising factor in the shell uh but they still stuck through it into modern days uh even with the uh mark 7 so uh the mark 7 still has those horns and everything like that on it, and the Mark 6A has the horns as well. Uh, but it's one of the unique features of the helmet, and it ended up being a pretty rugged helmet. You hardly see anything wrong on these helmets. They are pretty hard wearing for the most part, uh, and they're pretty low maintenance. Uh, really, all that you need to replace as the helmet gets beat up is um, the chin strap, really. Uh, the leather pads hold up way longer than the ACH pads and stuff, but they're also fairly easily replaceable uh, if you need to. It's just Velcro and tension for the most part. Um, so we'll get this out of the way and put up its replacement now. Um, here's the Mark 6A. And the easiest way to tell the Mark 6A uh, from the Mark 6 helmet is all the Mark 6As are black. Okay? And they're also thicker than the Mark 6 uh, Mark 6s. Uh, the Mark 6As came out in 2005 uh, for an urgent need with British soldiers in Iraq who, um, because the Mark VI wasn't offering the ballistic protection they needed, so rather than try to come up with a new design, they just had NP Aerospace crank out more helmets just thicker. Uh, it's a pretty good stopgap measure uh, until something better can be found. And um, so this helmet is heavier, a lot heavier than the Mark VI. Um, and the liners changed up too. Um, same exact kind of chin strap, so they, the chin straps are interchangeable. Uh, the liners are interchangeable um, with these, uh, although uh, you can't really take the liner out without proper tools because you need to be able to adjust those uh, rubber plugs. And uh, if you cut those, uh, there's no way to replace them unless you have extra rubber plugs. So you can't just take the liner out of this really without having the necessary uh, equipment to replace it. But they changed the crown to deal with that uh, cutting in that was happening with the uh, crown there. So they got this mesh crown pad now, and that is a um, a lot more comfortable than the uh, Mark VI's kind of Pazgat style ring uh, crown. And this helmet, uh, this exact liner pretty much, was transferred into the Mark VII helmet because it was liked so much. But other than that, everything's exactly the same. Takes the same chin strap, same liner, same uh, rubber plugs that go through the shell. Um, so as you can see one right there, sticking through. Uh, this is the reversible Special Forces helmet cover. So it's a Desert DPM on one side and a Woodland DPM on the other. And I have the High Viz cover underneath here just to have it. Pretty much just the same way I have the United Nations cover on the other, uh, on the regular Mark VI. Uh, it takes the same pads as the uh, Mark VI. Uh, everything's pretty much interchangeable here. 
uh, between the Mark 6A and the Mark 6, but this helmet is going to offer you more protection than the Mark 6, uh, but at the cost of increased weight. Now, in 2009, the Mark 6A was no longer cutting it in Afghanistan. British soldiers being being sent to Afghanistan were noticing protection issues with the Mark 6A. So the Mark 6A was replaced with the Mark 7, which was also designed by NP Aerospace, and it was the first British helmet issued to the military that wasn't ballistic nylon or steel. Um, or, your, you know, for general combat anyways. Um, and this helmet, uh, the Mark 7, was uh, aramid fiber, which is a, you know, Kevlar is aramid fiber, essentially. But, um, Kevlar is like a name brand, though, of a specific weave and mixture of aramid fiber, and it's just made out of aramid fiber, so don't don't say it's Kevlar, because um, it's not really Kevlar. Uh, but So we'll get the Mark 6A out of the way here now. Um, oh, I forgot to show you. See, there's the inside is uh, black and granulated instead of green and granulated. So, and in 2008, the Mark 7 came out. Now, this is my uh, Mark 7, one of them. I have uh, about four of these actually uh but this is one that is um i have pretty standard except for one feature there's one feature on it that isn't standard and that's the chin strap and we'll go over that when i get there um but these were issued in the multi-terrain camouflage pattern uh that england adopted to replace the dpm uh pattern as uh because it was uh functional in afghanistan it's made out of kind of a twill uh, nylon twill fabric got lots of elastic loops but the elastic on these british helmet covers is actually pretty shitty and it wears out really really fast so you'll see a lot of them cut off and you'll see just the little sewing marks that are left because most of the uh they'll cut them off a lot of times got one snap to hold in your goggles um all these uh british helmets are adjustable be a drawstring these are all all these helmets are size medium by the way and uh here's the inside of that as you can see uh the leather pad uh, carried over into the Mark 7, except uh, the Mark 7 leather pads have a lot more stitching reinforcements in them than the Mark 6 and the Mark 6A helmet. Um, it's also no longer a three-point chin strap, okay? It's a five-point chin strap. So as you can see, these two extra wings that come off the nape here that attach over to the side. Uh, this is also the same uh, strap as you can see it there, behind there, that kind of nylon one, that is used to adjust the... Um, length of the liner so if you pull this little uh, nylon strap here uh, this piece of the liner will get closer to the front which allows you to fit the helmet uh, but this chin strap come on camera focus come on now all right so but see this chin strap is only non-standard in the fact that it has the quick release buckle on it uh, which means somebody just took the ring that you would normally route this tail through. Uh, so there's normally just a ring like on this side that you would route the tail through and then you would do double D snaps, but instead they just routed it through a quick release buckle, uh, took the ring out. So it's just now quick release instead of having that little ring, which means you're not gonna wear out your snaps. And it's also a lot easier to get on and off, let's say if you had like a head injury or you were injured, it's a lot easier to take your helmet off. And um, this helmet is also normally issued with uh, these comfort pads, as you can see on the straps here. Um, and this ear foam piece here, uh, if I could get a better, so you can see it there. Um, a lot of these times, though, these aren't used because they interfere with your ability to use comms. So, but they were really just to um, keep the helmet m nicer, uh, for the most part, more comfortable. And, uh, the problem with the British helmets is they have a lot of front-to-back stability, but they don't have any lateral stability, which means the helmet tends to rock from side to side on your head very easy, and this solved a lot of that problem. Um, but it also, at the cost of, other than not being able to use comms, made the helmet very warm. You retained a lot more heat uh, in this helmet uh, because of that. Now, the Mark 7 is a lot thinner than the Mark 6A and the Mark 6 um, because uh, it's made out of a different, stronger fiber. It's actually really, really incredibly light, and I really, really like this helmet. Um, it is currently being uh, phasing out the Mark 6A and the Mark 6 uh, still as of today in the British military. Um, so I think the Mark VI is pretty much all but gone, if not already entirely gone, out of service. Uh, but there's still some Mark VI A's hanging around, and the Mark VII is right now the, the standard combat helmet uh, until enough Virtus helmet systems, and the Virtus helmet systems are like the British version of the ECH, uh, come into play to replace the Mark VII's uh, for outside-the-wire missions. Um, but until then, 
Uh, these helmets are, this is the uh, evolution of the British helmet. This is still currently used. I don't have a Virtus helmet yet, but it's pretty much an ACH with a suspension type liner kind of like this in it. Um, so they're made by Revision. Uh, so it's the first British helmet not made in England either. So, um, but these uh, helmets uh, are pretty expensive for the most part. All of them are pretty expensive in good condition. Um, so Mark 6s uh, in when they come to America normally can go around $100. Mark 6 A's coming to America can go from between 100 to 200 And Mark 7s are about that price too. Um, so hopefully you guys like this video. And uh, now you can see all of the uh, comparisons in shape. Uh, if you want to see these helmets a little bit better uh, without all of the uh, attachments or anything on them, if you want to get individual uh, views on these helmets, uh, they all have their own videos, respectively. So you feel free to go back into my helmet playlist and check out all these helmets uh, individually if you want to see them compared uh, to each other and everything without the helmets if you're interested in that. Uh, but this is kind of more of a visual evolution of British military helmets throughout, uh, British composite helmets, sorry, throughout their inception uh, to today for the most part. So hopefully you guys like this, and I haven't seen another video like this on YouTube yet uh, where you can see everything kind of all piled together uh, in one and do some comparisons in the same video without having to look uh, in separate videos and stuff like that. Um, sorry I didn't take all of the... Uh, covers and stuff off in this video, but that would have taken way too much time for me to do and to set up for this and everything like that. And I only covered a general brief history. There is so much more information you can get on all of these helmets uh, as far as where they were used, how long their service life was, how long their service life was intended to be, uh, their exact ballistic specs and stuff like that. You can find all of that stuff in other videos and things like that and some reading because really a book or is really the best place you're going to find information on these. So this was more of a general overview and hopefully you guys like this. Um, so I could keep doing other, uh, videos like this, and, uh, again, I'm sorry, I haven't made a video in a very long time, and, uh, hopefully you guys like this video, and, uh, you subscribe if you're into this sort of stuff, um, I'm really, really liking, uh, how many subscribers I get, I usually get about two or three per day, which doesn't sound a lot, but I, I really enjoy it, um, I make these videos just because I enjoy them, uh, and just to get a little bit more information out there on stuff like this, because there's a lot of helmet collectors out there, actually. Um, if you have any, uh, questions or comments or suggestions for future videos, leave those in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, thank you so much, you guys, for watching and hopefully I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.